Hi, I'm John. I'm one of the owners of the gallery. Uh, thanks for coming. We're very excited to have Glenn Rennell with us here instead of in Arizona. Um, so it's a special treat. Uh, just a little bit about uh, Glenn's background. He was born here in Portland uh, and raised in New York. He attended the Rhode Island School of Design, uh, spent four years in the Navy, and then graduated from Fort Wright College with a BFA in painting. That's right. Um, omitting the years, but sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm old. <laughs> he went on to receive an MFA in painting at the University of Massachusetts and then taught design, drawing, and painting at the Maine College of Art uh, for over 20 years. Right. Uh, Glenn left teaching to paint full time and now resides in Southeast Arizona. Uh, his works have been included in numerous museum shows and are included in public and private collections around the world. We're excited to have Glenn here to talk about his work as it uh, reflects a profound understanding of the relationship between <laughs> a painter, a place, and the viewer, uh, as are seen in the subtleties of light and the relationships of sky, land, and horizon, which are beautifully rendered in his paintings. And with that, I don't know where that came from, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, actually I want to talk about sort of the where these paintings came from as far as the color and a year ago I was asked to uh, do a lecture presentation on working from a limited palette and uh, while these may not look like a limited palette their uh, their roots are in that process so in doing that, uh, I had taught working from a limited pal palette several times when I was at the art school over the years. Some successful, some not so sex successful, but um, it was a way to structure part of a semester that gave me a handle and gave the students a handle. And uh, my introduction to that came from when I was a graduate student, the first time I taught, I taught a design course and I didn't even know what design really was. And uh, it was a hideous, it was an awful experience for the students and uh, not a great one for me. And, but uh, I went to the uh, head of the department after this semester and uh, he said, well, we won't do design again, we'll do painting. Which you would think that, you know, that's better, but you know. Anyway, so he suggested working from a limited palette. And his mentor was uh, Jack Torkoff who taught at Yale, abstract expressionist, really great painter, and um, a painter I've admired you know, since I've been painting. And if you look at his work, uh, a lot of the older stuff, and some of the, the later stuff from the 70s, he was using the same limited palette and such. So, uh, and my, the, George Wardlaw is who I worked with in graduate school, and he lives in Maine part-time now. So the idea of the limited palette was to, you know, with restrictions sort of comes freedom. You can only do so much, but you have to do within this. And the, the let me start with this here. Don't touch the glass. Look at this and pass it back. And here's another one. This is. The limited palette is black and white, yellow ochre, and burnt sienna. So that's the limitation there. Not on these, but just the, these two here. And what I did was, because I was doing this presentation, I decided, well, I really wanted to go through the process if I was going to do this intelligently. And uh, so I wound up, I just, I took the paints, I did color charts, you know, and uh, found the most beautiful neutral grays and, you know, made grounds out of some of those and then uh, started painting with this thing. So I have these, you know, color charts of all the possibilities I could, you know, possibly make up on the wall. And then, uh, which in color, when you're just really simply mixing color with these things, you get sort of a purity to it. And they, they look pretty intense. When you started on the palette and you started mixing these things on the, on the painting, they turned to mud. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the point being of, of a limited palette is that you're dealing with what's out there and you're trying to find a visual equivalent of it 
on the painting. And what I can't do that literally, what I can do is I can find the relative difference between things. So it's always about light, dark, bright and dull, and the hue. So this is, this is what I can do. So I can't make a blue with this. All I can do is mix the black and the white, and it can feel like blue if everything else around it is warmer. You know, so, so I can make this feel blue without it literally being a blue. This, the red can become an intense red if it's, you know, every, in the context that it's in. So this becomes an interesting way of, it's like that step that painters often have a hard time of making is realizing that what's out there isn't the most important thing. It becomes the painting. The painting is a fiction. You're telling a story with this. And if I can't tell it literally, I have to say, uh, if I'm, if the recreation is selective. I can't show everything. I have to show what little I can. And so those choices become the choices of painting. Everybody with me so far? I always like to talk about this. this is, it's, it's silly, but the, it actually comes from uh, Aristotle originally. And through my fuzzy brain, it comes out as the law of identity. And that we identify and we know by difference. In the, in the painting thing, you have that choice. Something is either exactly the same or it's different. And when I'm, when I'm painting, I have to become sensitive to what's different. And so if I can modulate and if I can make these choices of difference, I, I can do it. If I don't, I can't. So I, and as in painting and in, in doing a lot of things, the more you do it and you understand it, it becomes internalized and it becomes sort of like a sub subconscious thing, an automatic thing. So I'm mixing paint on the palette. I'm not asking myself what the difference is, you know, in a conscious way, but in a subconscious way, all these choices come through. And you go, I'm mixing the color and all of a sudden, yeah, that's, that's what I want. You know, without having to say, well, I need to make this a little lighter, a little darker. If it is, and if I take and I put the painting on the, uh, put the color on the painting, and it is wrong, then I ask myself, you know, is it too light, is it too dark, is it too bright, is it too dull, is it too red, too blue? But in the process of painting, that, that step of where you, you go to where it becomes automatic, rather than sort of a, a talking process, where I don't have to, I don't, if I'm painting well, I'm not talking everything I do to myself. You know, I have to have the words when I make a mistake, but when I'm going well, I don't need the words. But it doesn't go well that often. <laughs> so one of the things I do in the studio is that I, I listen to, um, you know, audible books. And I listen to stuff that I would ordinarily put me to sleep. Uh, but it's really interesting. But I can do that, and that sort of takes part of the conscious mind away. So when I'm painting, I'm working at a more automatic, subconscious level. And while these don't look really like, you know, splashy, you know, kind of uh, abstract expressionist paintings, they are very much a, a, a sort of a, a sense of, you know, working at an automatic level. So, yeah. So, everybody's looked and seen the, the paintings and stuff. And, you know, they're not great, but they're a pretty good, pretty nice painting for the limitation. So what I did was when I, when I started working on these, and I had, when, I did, when I did the limited color thing, I did 25 paper paintings like that and put them up on a grid as I was doing on the studio wall. And it looked really great, you know. And uh, so it was, uh, that felt like a real, you know, presentation. But uh, it gave me an idea, what happened was that it, they became clearer and clearer as I went along. I was able to take what, and I, I like working in a very narrow value range. And my paintings when they're really bad, they're beautiful to me because I love this sort of mud. You know, I think this, when I'm doing it, this little bit of difference there, I go, wow, that's amazing. Anybody else who normally human being looks at it and goes, what are you kidding me? There's nothing there. 
So but when my paintings are bad, they're too much the same. When they're good, you get that range of difference. I still like a, generally a narrower value range, and I like to keep a complexion to the painting and that sort of thing. But uh, it's not uh, whatever. So when I started painting these, it was a process of how clear can I start to make colors with a little bit broader palette. So on my general palette, I used to have like 18 colors out there. And, you know, because I, they're pretty. And I use them, and I get all these subtle differences and everything. So I narrowed it down to six to eight colors. And I wouldn't put them out all at once like you're supposed to, you know, when you start a painting. I just put out a color as I thought I absolutely needed it, and then would try to, try to not put out something else. So that, uh, Pretty much all the, not all, but quite a few of the skies in here are only painted with uh, two, two colors. You know, so it would be, on some of them, it would be a, uh, uh, a light yellow and a violet. You know, like a Naples yellow light. And that would give me a sense of Actually, that's this one, which nobody can see, is a good example of that. <laughs> yes, that one there, this one. So it was like, how little does it take to make something that looks rich, rather than ordinarily my idea is, well, if I put everything in it, it's going to feel, re feel really rich. So this reversed how I was thinking about it a little bit. And the other thing I did on most of these was that in the foreground, there isn't any white in any of the paint. In a few of them there are, but for the most part, I was just mixing, you know, a few earth colors and stuff. So, and what I'm finding is, you know, that, you know, the old uh, modernist maxim, less is more, well, sometimes it really is. You know, how far could you push this? Well, it would be nothing after a while. But at this point, you know, it's pretty interesting. The color's becoming rich, and uh, it's nice to have a challenge, you know? So I've been painting all these years. I go into the studio, and I paint every day just about, you know, four, six hours or so. And uh, I take a nap in there, too, but that's... <laughs> uh, and so you, I'm 70 now, I'm going to be 71 a couple weeks. It's really exciting painting for me. And I think that's one of the things we, we sometimes forget. You know, you look at this, well, that looks like Glenn's work. He just does the same thing, everything for, the, you know, 30 years. But for the person doing it, small differences become very exciting, very engaging. And you feel like, you know, you're really alive. And you're, you're pushing, and you are, you know, so. It's been one of the really uh, great benefits of leaving teaching when I did, was that uh, you know, teaching was wonderful. I learned so much from the students, from the other faculty and all that. It was, you know, more art education for me happened when I was teaching than it did when I was in school. But uh, now it's, it's, it's been a really wonderful experience, having that kind of time and working in that sort of Focus. So Lori is here, Lori Trembley, and she has an article. <laughs> this uh, in the Maine Arts Journal, uh, the fall issue, and about her work and stuff, and uh, it's really interesting. And she and I have shared a quote that I really love, and it's uh, this is from T. S. Eliot. And it's poetry communicates before it's understood. And I think that that's something we should keep in mind when we're looking at art. You know, it's that sort of, you look at, you see, you know it, and it says something to you. It makes your life richer, you know, and then you can really think about it. But the, it's that wonderful thing that comes over you that I think we share as human beings. And uh, so.
I love that. And the other thing I wanted to, uh, this year up in, our, uh, up in Utah, right, do that, the past three years I've been giving talks, and uh, this year it was on modernism, and uh, uh, Maynard Dixon, who's a Western painter, and uh, so his, where he was in, uh, in modernism and, you know, the, sort of a history of modernism from, from the 1790s to about 1973 or so. But in that, it got me back to reading Tom Wolfe's The Painted Word. And uh, <laughs> I know. And I, you know, I'm a, you know, especially when I was in school, I'm a true believer in modernism. You know, I think it's, you know, this experience and everything. But uh, so his, you know, it, the, the thing I love from it, um, he went to all these galleries and museums over the year looking at all these, uh, you know, big abstract paintings, you know, the mother wells and all this sort of stuff. And he was waiting for the aha moment, you know, where you go, ah, oh, I get it. And uh, his conclusion after all that was, because uh, he never had it, his aha uh, moment was uh, getting to the point where he had always thought that seeing was believing. And then he finally realized for this, for him, you had to be a believer to see. Believing was seeing in art. And there's always a, I think in contemporary work now, there's that same sort of thing. If you're there, you believe in it, it's great. If you're not there, you know, if you don't understand it, you don't get it. And I think that, that flows through a lot of people. You know, a lot of people who are, would be really entranced and really into, you know, what's going on contemporarily would come in and go, look, well, anybody can do this crap, you know? And uh, so it's, a, you know, where you are as a person. You know, and how you see the world all comes through this. So, <laughs> and the other thing, I, just as a, going back a little bit, is that generally my paintings work in very close value range. And uh, there's always a relationship. I can make something really close in value work really well, but I have to narrow sort of the, 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 the hue, too, to make that work well. By in these, I think I've broadened the value range a little bit, and that allows me to bring the color up a little bit, too. So that it has a very similar feeling, but it's a different sort of range of what's happening there. And I think if you walk around the gallery and you look at other paintings and stuff, you always see there's a, there's a how if you try to separate value from the color and then to try to look at color and then look at the value and then bring it together. And so the broader value range allows higher keyed color and stuff and vice versa. So anyways, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Any questions? <laughs> Can you talk about your gradations and your sky at all? Because that, for me, is one of the things that you really sort of opened that up for me, just looking at your work over the past decade. Um, you know, is that something you started observing more when you moved out west? Is it something, or is it I'd, always something that you've been doing? I think, it's, I think it's because I don't... As a landscape painter, most people, especially working on site, you tend to not mix with the knife. You mix with the brush and you bring it in, you do this and, and so on. And you put the color on. And uh, I've never been comfortable doing that. So what I do is discreetly mix pieces of paint and then put them on the, the canvas or whatever. So it, it's knife and then brush. And so I'm not mixing with the brush. So I'm not sort of contaminating the color at all. So I'm putting this on, and I will mix with the brush a little bit, especially towards the end. So I'm putting this on, it, it, it sounds tedious, but every little gradation that goes up, every little change there, I've mixed the paint differently on the palette. So, uh, and then I leave a little bit of what I've mixed so that I can compare it to what I have. And, uh, it sounds tedious, but it, it goes very quickly. 
you know, most of these paintings, the initial sort of painting of the painting, most of them have been worked over, you know, several days or longer. But the initial painting in most of the skies, it's, you know, an hour, you know, hour and a half. But, uh, Does that answer that at all? Yeah, yeah. I just think it's something, whether it's your observation or the way that you execute it, it's something that I haven't seen in very many other yeah. painters. But well, I start from the bottom and I go to the top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that's one of the things, too. Is if you're not teaching and stuff, you, you tend to find your uh, ways that you would never tell anybody else how to do it. Not because it's a secret, just because it's sort of inefficient and, uh, I don't know, kind of dumb. <laughs> but I do love it, and I love color on the palette. Sometimes that's, you know, I'll take it and spread out a piece on the palette. And the, the palette I use mostly is just a wooden uh, palette, and it's, so it's got this wonderful, almost glass-like surface to it that's a really a neutral, I don't know, mud sort of color. But you put a piece of paint down there, you put one next to it, and if I'm working really close in value, sometimes it's like, I'm not sure. You know, is it lighter or is it darker? And, you know, it takes a second. So it's a, I don't know. Did these turn out the way when you start the painting and what you get here at the end? Did yeah. They, did they match up? No. <laughs> I mean, I. I, I really don't often have an, an idea of where it's going. You know? And uh, it's like on a sky, or if the process in a lot of these little ones is I'll come in and I'll, you know, I'll just, I'll do all the, the, the tree dark sort of stuff and then decide what the sky is gonna be. You know, and I'll paint that and then I'll do the foreground. And don't ever do that. That's not how you paint a painting. But, uh, so it's... Where are these scenes? Most of them are from uh, Lemington and Buxton and originally, Vinyl Haven and stuff, so... So it's from your memory? Memory, photograph, uh, on-site work, yeah. it's a mixture of it. Yeah. For years I worked plein air and would, you know, one of my rules was it had to be done on-site completely and stuff and, uh, you know, I don't anymore. I don't work, when I do work in photographs, I use lousy photographs. Oftentimes I'll paint them, I'll print them on plain paper and I won't, you know, have them close to the painting. Because I, one of the problems with photography is that the camera selects all. And uh, you can get seduced into painting what the photograph saw and not what you saw. So you, that idea of selective recreation, you better re, a photograph is, you know, it's not how we really see. You know, if I'm looking out there, I think I see everything in, in focus, but I don't. I see like one thing. And so I've got to keep moving as I paint to paint. And, uh, you know, and we're binocular, you know. So even if I, if I step over here, it's a completely different view and if I'm here, and if I'm making a painting and I'm outside and I'm moving around, I'm painting and I'm moving here and I'm stepping back, I'm stepping over, yeah. and the camera doesn't do that. And so when I do use a photograph, I have to sort of be very aware that it's a photograph, you know, because it's pretty, it's nice. I can copy that, you know. And I do keep in my mind that, that a painting is a fiction. You know, I'm really trying to tell, you know, or make a piece of poetry, sort of, rather than tell, tell you everything I know. Here's just one little glimpse. Yes, Priscilla. <laughs> well, hearing you speak while I'm sitting here and just absorbing these, it's very moving to me. And I do not want ever again to hear you say anything about being, anything being stupid, because this is profound work. And so I'm saying this is a non a non painter, right? Um, these are slow pieces, mm -hmm. and by slow I mean that all, you look and more and more emerges, yeah. and um, it's profound. You know, each time you look, it's okay. a different piece. 
And, um, and when you talked about your experience of mixing color and having two colors that are so, um, well, they're so close, but to you there's this, you can see this dramatic mm -hmm. difference. I mean, that's sacred work. That is sacred work. You know, I, 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 one I, more I, thing, one more thing, and then I'll shut up. And that is, um, <laughs> You know, someone smart, wise, said um, that the most important thing the artist creates is the artist. And, um, and that's what's happening here. And yeah. that's what's happening when you describe yeah. how you feel. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. everything you said, except that I do do stupid things. I do arbitrary <laughs> things. I'm on, what's it exciting, because, you know, these are done. You know, these, to me, part, they're, they're like old now. You know, what I'm interested in is what's going to happen next. And to make it exciting for me, it's like, how can I be on that, that edge, that place where I know all this, but I don't know that. And so I do do stupid things. I make really bad choices in paintings. And I have like a, you know, 30% batting average. You know, there are many more of these that are, that are in the studio that will be, um, you know, firewood this winter. You know, out in the, we, in Arizona, we, we have really nice outdoor <laughs> fires. <in> the, <laughs> and that's also a great release. When you take something, you realize, you know, that was, you know, ah, you know, it's, it's gone. What do I care? So, yes. You were talking, you mentioned about your, about your com the, the complexions, and maybe in relation to those two colors that are so close. And the graduation yeah. I think that okay there's, there's the color of the light there's a color of a particular time of day mm -hmm. and place oftentimes you know with reflect whatever it is and it's reflected and I think that sometimes it's I make it too strong a harmony in a painting where you look at what well, everything you know if I could just look underneath that color then the, the real color would be there so does that make, like a film of red is over everything. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I do that too much. But that's sort of, the idea of that complexion, that, that there's a harmony that everything shares in there. I have all colors, but I have a color. Mm -hmm. you know, so I want you know, the full range of hue, but I also want you know, a particular sense of light, sense of air almost. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I like that idea that, that I'm, you know, when I'm painting, that. It's not just the things I see out there, but it's that distance, it's the air between there. Yeah, you really notice when we come back east that there's a substance to the air, you know, and you don't feel that in the west as much. So, to me, yeah. Think of it as a harmony, yeah. So you have little harmonies, you have a big harmony. You have little differences and big differences. <laughs> Western versus Eastern sensibilities. Would you say that over the years you've been inspired by um, the Western style? And if so, what exactly is that? Whoa. <laughs> I don't know. I've I've come in con being out in, in Arizona. I've come in contact with a lot of paint painters from the West, and. Uh, who are really good. Uh, most of them come from a commercial background. They were, you know, illustrators and stuff, and then decided to become painters. And I come from the, the fine arts background, and I'm a, a noodler, and, you know, I just want to get this thing all going, and I don't have any deadlines, and I'm just going to, you know, work in this. And they, they take a very much more practical look at it and uh, are very efficient in paintings. I'm not, I'm not an efficient painter at all. You know, I struggle in every you know, thing I do, and they have this ability because they worked under deadlines, they worked under you know, things that were meant for reproduction and sort of stuff, so they, they have that, those sort of skills which are very different. Uh, I, I don't know. I really don't know the difference. Because I sort of just do what I want to do. <laughs> well, I notice sometimes clients who live out, out west will be especially um, intrigued by your work. And I wonder if 
Oh. There was a, a link for it. I don't know. Maybe it's the sky. It could be. It's a lot of the sky. I like low horizons, you know. And, uh, and I'd, I'd, where we live is an amazing place if you're there in the morning or in the evening. If you're there at lunchtime, you go, why the hell would anybody live here? <laughs> it's dull, the you know, everything's washed out, and uh, you know, so there is a difference there. Yeah, and I do, I, if I were gonna be completely honest, some of these main trees have uh, Arizona skies on them. <laughs> so. What do you think, Joe? Okay? Good. Okay. <laughs> Joe Nicoletti is back here. Joe has come out and painted with me over the years, and uh, it's not, it's not easy, is it? No. No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes? I wanted to ask you about the drawing in relation to your painting. Okay. You're talking about working with very close value relationships yeah. in your painting, but the drawings that, that come to mind that I've seen are these black tempera on white paper, yep. very high contrast, little dry brush. Yeah. And I wonder if you, how is your approach? Um, is it Are people familiar with my big black and whites? Mm -hmm. Anyways, if you're not, it doesn't make, but they're, it's, I use black acrylic and a, you know, bristle brush, and I just take and I draw this stuff. And uh, the difference is, for me, drawing is, a, is a, a wonderful release in a way. And I'm still, I try to be really accurate in what I'm doing. You know, when they really work, it's almost that same feeling of being so precise with the color. But what I'm trying to be precise with is pattern. You know, and uh, I love doing gestural stuff, which is hard to see in this. I love the idea, of, you know, when I'm doing a little painting, um, uh, either standing or sliding around on a stool between, you know, I, I roll around from the painting and then over to the palette. So it's... Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, in a drawing, I'm standing up, um, I'm left-handed, so I'm I'm taking, and I'm like this. So I'm, I'm drawing from my toes to the end of the brush. And it's, it's a same thing, but completely different. You know, the same eyes, the same sort of temperament and everything. But it also allows me to be very physical. And uh, I, you know, in undergraduate and graduate school, I was an abstract expressionist, you know, and I, I always say this, but I would take a gallon of paint and go like this onto the canvas and go back and go, I'm a genius. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I was. That's the problem when you're young. You think you're really smart. <laughs> but uh, and this, is a, this one is actually sort of pretty tight in a way, very precise and stuff. But, uh, and this is from the Western Cemetery. This is the title of something. Where we Here we lie, or something. Where we live. Where, where we lie. Where we where lie. We lie. Yeah. yeah. So it's a little morbid, but <laughs> I love cemeteries. I like the graphic quality and the the, the tombstones, and it's just yeah. So, but I do. I don't think that they're as different in my mind as they look. Although I can't like draw in the morning and then paint in the afternoon because it's, it's that, it's so different that I would start to draw in the paint or vice versa. So when I do these, it's usually like over a month to six weeks I take it and the whole studio becomes filled with these 30 by 40 black and whites all the way around. And that's nice too because it's, again, it's a pretty low batting average. You know, because you, you, there's no fixing this. It's just acrylic paint. There's no way to erase it. There's no white paint in there. So when they hit, they're really neat. 
When they don't, it becomes wrapping paper, <laughs> which is really fun, actually. Greeting cards and wrapping paper are my drawings. No, go ahead. Do you ever use like a, I don't know, an underpainting, or do you just like that freshness of the canvas? No, I I can't paint on white. Yeah. So do, do you, what color do you? Do Anything. You like a, Some you can feel like the red there. I don't think I don't know sure that was what was there, but I would do, yeah. and I do up panels. It, these are all on half inch Baltic birch uh, plywood, and then I've uh, gessoed all everything, and then the the face of it gets three or four coats and then so it's pretty stable I think but uh, so I'll do and I'll just you know sometimes at the end of the day if it's if the paint is interesting on the palette I'll put it on the ground with that other times I'll go through and just take like an you know red oxide and something else to dull it a little bit and put it on there and wipe it off and stuff mm -hmm. so but then it gives me like this little file thing where I go through and I'll be thinking of a painting and these things be all different. I'll just pick out one and, and start it. So. And you have it all pre-done and ready for when you. Yeah. Do yeah. Yeah. So all the ground things and it's a. Generally, I use an oil. It'll be an, an oil. Not oil color, yeah. rather than acrylic. Yeah. But. <laughs> and the, what it allows me to, because I, if I work on a white ground, my tendency is to paint too light, because when you put it down there, it feels dark no matter what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if I'm on a middle tone ground, then I have a sense of the value better. Mm -hmm. And going back to when I was when I would teach uh, limited palette. The first couple things were all black and white, but what I would do is have people uh, do middle tone gray grounds mm -hmm. and then do two of them and do the same painting, but on the one painting, the ground was the darkest dark, and on the other painting, the ground was the lightest light. Mm -hmm. And so that you would come away with the understanding that the relative difference is what made it. Yeah, I didn't need a full range of value to get a sense of light or a sense of, of light to dark. Yeah. And I think people sometimes confuse uh, sort of value range with light. If it's you know, strong in value, it's a sense of light, and it's not. You know, it could be, but it's you know, generally not. Yes, Laurie. I can't hear you. Speak up. Oh, um, so I have a comment with a question at the end. Okay. So one of the things I've always really responded to in your work is your sense of, of atmosphere and that feeling or a sense of the air feels clean yeah. in your work, like after it rains. Okay. Okay. Um, and when you were talking about your drawing and how you're drawing from the tip of your toe to the end of your brush, I'm wondering if when you're painting and you're finding that place of harmony, do you have a feeling in your body that's responding to the painting? Like, is there a kinesthetic relationship that happens? I think so. I don't know if I would explain it that way. Yeah, but very, very soon in the painting, I have an idea of, of where it's going to go. I don't know exactly, but I do have that sense of, of how wide the value range is going to be and what color overall that, that sense is going to be. Yeah. And sometimes it's a, a complete surprise, though. Yeah. So I'd, I'm always open to you know, things happening, and, and they do. Yeah. So. <laughs> Come on, one more question. Let's go. Yes. Okay, so do you want to just tell us, like, for example, what would be on your, what 
colors would be laying on your palette to make, for example, this, this painting? painting? Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know. I'm, Just for example. I'm trying to eyes. think. I'm not very uh, scientific when it comes to colors. Like I've known people, you know, they get a nice color, they write down what it, you know, what it took to make it. And so, like, what would your, like, well, this is this is Naples yellow light right out of the tube. In fact, I drew the tube across there. But what about the grays and the darks and the shadowy areas? Okay, so on the palette, <laughs> I would have. Uh, I usually use zinc white, and then I'll, I have to think going across the palette. I would have uh, ultramarine blue, uh, maybe a cerulean, depending on if I need it. I don't think that has it, but uh, then I always have, I change out violets all the time. For a while, I was love, in love with ultramarine violet, which is a very weak color, but you can make these really subtle little differences with it, and right now, I don't, how do you say, quinidacrone, whatever, purple, whatever. That's what's taken that place now. Then usually a magenta, mm -hmm. then a cadmium red, a cadmium yellow, and yellow ochre. That's pretty, and then sometimes uh, I've been using uh, a uh, greenish umber by, that I really like as a color that I can dull things with, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. So it's not a lot there. And what I'd like to, I think what I'm, the next thing I'm going to be doing is to just go back to primaries and see what I can make happen with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No black, a little bit of white, mm -hmm. and just primaries. So. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Thank you all. I appreciate it.